actually a separate recording. Now we're up on YouTube. We're good. Great. Terrific. Let me make an adjustment. All right. Thank you. So um, I'm going to ask you just to join me in a, a moment of silence. I saw on the news uh, over the last couple days that our um, our national death toll from COVID is, is again over 2,000 individuals every day, and it's so sad. Um, so so let's just uh, have a moment of silence and prayer for those who and their families who are impacted, still impacted by COVID-19. Amen. Thank you. And um, just another reminder that everything we can do to stay safe and uh, healthy um, is an important thing to do. So um, for the most part here, I'm going to turn this discussion over to our planning department. And then I think we'll uh, maybe after a summary, take these uh, issues that came up kind of one at a time, maybe, and talk about them as, uh, as appropriate and as y'all would like to. Um, Robert Summerfield, our planning director. Robert. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, members of council and the planning commission for, uh, for making time this afternoon. I know, uh, I, especially our city council, you guys are meeting to death. So I really appreciate the fact that once again, you've taken time out of very busy schedules to uh, participate in this discussion. It underscores just how vital and important the comprehensive plan is to the community. Um, and particularly this plan, which is a, a complete ground up redo of the comprehensive plan. Um, it's not just an update to the Century 5, it's a, it's a brand new way of thinking about how we plan for the future of the city of Charleston. Um, so real quickly, I'm gonna just have a couple comments and then Mr. Morgan is gonna take us through. Um, as the mayor mentioned, we, we did a very comprehensive review of what's in the plan during the last workshop. Um, additionally, we've had the public hearing on the plan that was at the Planning Commission, then we've had the subsequent public hearing um, for the plan that was at the City Council. Um, so from those, uh, that original overview, from the discussions that have been had in those two public hearings, you know, there were a few things that are still outstanding. I believe staff has addressed the ones that we believe were pretty easy fixes, if you would, or pretty um, uh, no nonsense changes. Um, and Christopher will walk through those. There are a few things though that we did hear through conversations that we had individually with members of the council following that workshop, as well as some other conversations that have gone on that may require some additional conversation and discussion. And that's mainly what today's workshop is about, is to have those conversations uh, for back uh, up material, if need be, we do have the list of all of the recommendations that are in the city plan that we can pull up should we need to, uh, but we really wanted to be respectful of everyone's time and, and kind of center or focus this conversation around the ones that have been identified as maybe some kind of points of uh, additional conversation. Uh, one of those, and I want to just take a moment, and I know Christopher will go over this in more detail, but I want to you know, thank the folks at Dover Coal for the work they did on, um, on the, the plan that they put together, the alternative option, if you would, for Canehoy. I think that they put some really good work in there. Um, I would just remind everyone, though, because we've had some questions that have come from the community recently, that has not been adopted. In fact, I unfortunately, the city was not reached out to to participate in that effort. So it doesn't have uh, the same level of analysis that was done uh, as a part of the city's plan. Um, the, the water land analysis that we've done, it, it was pretty comprehensive. And so um, while I respect the work that they did, I mean, they've been a tremendous partner with us when the uh, West Ashley plan was done. And I fully believe that they will be a partner with us in other efforts. Uh, unfortunately, that work you know, is kind of a separate uh, animal, if you would, from the, the work of the city plan. Um, and so I would just remind everybody that, you know, while that is very nice what they've done, it is not exactly consistent with the work that was done through uh, the very in-depth teamwork that was done on the land use and water analysis that the city conducted. Um, and so I would just 
ask that everyone keep that in mind as well as we move forward in these discussions today. Uh, with that, you have the entire comprehensive uh, plan team on board here led by Mr. Morgan. He's going to go through these uh, things that we heard and that we've made some adjustments based on what we heard. Additionally, there were some comments that we heard that we think require some additional conversation. Um, we think we still have a strategy going forward for them, but we felt like they may be things that, that require some additional conversation. Um, and from there, we are open to anything that we didn't capture on the list that any member of the city council or the planning commission feel like are still hanging out there. So with that, Mr. Morgan, I'll turn it over to you. And Christopher, you're muted, sir. There you go. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, thanks again to our whole staff that worked so hard on this and to our amazing consultants uh, who have just done an amazing, really thorough job on this, giving us all the info we needed to come up with the recommendations in this document. And then to our planning commission for working through all of those and spending tremendous amounts of time. We've never spent as much time with our planning commission on any previous um, uh, citywide comprehensive plan. So we really appreciate their time on that. And I think the, the impact of their uh, input really shows in what you are, are going to be seeing or have seen already. And as we talk on today, you will hear about that further. Um, so we went through the um, both the City Council Planning Commission workshop from June 30th and the public hearing from July 21st and listen to all the comments that you all had made, you all being city council and kind of have summarized those as things that we, it seemed that there were items that you wanted to have individual discussions with on. We've had a number of meetings with council members who did bring up issues. And uh, we think we've worked out some of the, those issues that they brought up. Uh, and uh, hopefully through today's discussion, we can solve any others that, that, that come along. Um, but um, what we wanted to start with were some downtown um, plan map comments. Um, and I'm going to just flip to our first screen here. Um, and this is the uh, Union Pier issue. And um, we all know that, you know, the Ports Authority is looking to redevelop Union Pier and sell off almost all or all of it. And um, in the plan, we had looked at it as kind of an industrial use. That's what it's always been in our previous plans as an industrial use. And we heard from a number of council members that they might like the plan to take a more active role in making recommendations for Union Pier. And, you know, that's really going to be difficult without a full planning exercise itself for Union Pier that, you know, we think really should involve the public. And so what our proposal on this was is to, instead of calling Union Pier industrial, call it what we call a future planning area, which we've had in previous plans. In fact, we had it in the previous Century 5 plan and um, say that in these future planning areas, you have to have a full community plan put together it, with extensive public involvement to come up with what those future land uses will be. We know there's been previous planning on Union Pier and some of it's been very, very good, but we probably need to revisit all of that as this begins to get sold off and look into, you know, how the neighborhoods feel about the types of uses that would be here, what kind of uh, traffic can be accommodated in our streets, you know, what kind of views would be uh, available, what kind of parks, all those types of issues way too many issues to go into in a 30,000 foot type of plan, uh, like our city plan, our uh, comprehensive plan, but it's definitely something that could be undertaken before those land uses uh, are designated in a future map. So that was our recommendation for the Union Pier area. Happy to um, answer any comments or further questions on that before we move on to other items. Christopher. Council Member Jackson. Thank you. It just occurs to me, um, are there other future planning areas that you've now designated as, as a result of this, um, you know, strategic thinking, or is this the only one? This was the only one. It was the only one that we were, you know, brought, you know, that has been brought up by council members as, you know, wanting to have a little bit more input on in this document. 
Um, you know, we certainly could discuss if there are things that folks think need other uh, designation in that manner. But um, this was this was what we thought was an appropriate uh, approach to the Union Pier area. Hey, Christopher, if I might, uh, Councilwoman Jackson. So while there's no other land that's identified under the, the future land use maps currently for this designation, in previous versions of the comp plan, it has served as kind of a holding district until such time as those those areas did um, come forward with development plans that then um, found the appropriate designation for them. So it works as a, as a really good, um, we know it's not going to remain industrial, but we don't know exactly, you know, what that plan is going to be at this point. And so this creates a really good opportunity to create this holding space for it while those efforts are underway. <coughs> and, and Christopher, with this area, oh, go ahead, Ms. Jackson, I'm sorry. Sense to you me, Robert. You? Um, so I, I, I mean, I, I was thinking that maybe, or, or Actually, my next question then is how hard is it to change the future land use map once we adopt the plan? Would it be more sensible to, you know, sort of drill down into some other maps and see if we should make this more um, future forward designation? Or can we do that, you know, at another date once we're in into a discussion or a planning strategy for something that isn't obvious right this minute to be that? future planning area. I think it's a good option to have because a lot's changing. So anyway. So so I would say, and Christopher can jump in and correct me if, if I misstate anything, but I think that this is going to be a pretty in-depth plan when this comes forward. And so as a part of that effort, we will be putting something forward for the council and the planning commission to recommend to adopt. So that will be the time when we will have that opportunity to update this map. Um, and it can be done as a, you know, a unified process. It's, it would not be any more onerous to update the map than the process will already have to go through to address whatever that plan, that ultimate plan might look like for Union Pier. And, and if I could add on to what Robert was saying, it's been very commonplace for us when we have our small area plans like Plan West Ashley or Rethink Folly Road or plans like that, that we adopt those plans as part of the comprehensive plan. So let's say in a few years, a union peer full plan is done and it's brought to you all and you all agree with it, it would be adopted as part of the comprehensive plan. At that point in time, we might make the changes to the maps uh, as designated from that plan. Right. Council member, Council member Mitchell and then Commissioner uh, Lassane. Just, just, just a quick question. Uh, how far is that uh, you're talking about coming down, uh, heading north? All right, yeah, we don't have any street names on here and I apologize for that. Um, this is uh, Market Street. So the land, this the uh, current cruise terminal area is over in here, if you all can see my cursor. Then mm -hmm. these are warehouses. This is East Bay Street. Right. And then this is, um, I believe Lauren, this is uh, Lauren, Lauren Street. Street. That's right. Right here to the north. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Washington Street running right through here. The Harris okay. Teeter's right here. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. That's all I need to know. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Lassane. Thank you, Mayor. And, and I just want to clarify uh, with either Mr. Summerfield or Mr. Morgan. Uh, this uh, designation does not change the current zoning that's on the site. Any future zoning changes that would need to be to facilitate future development would require the whole rezoning process in addition. So that may give people additional comfort. Well, I, I just add that this, I think this is a wise way for us to go um, it's clear it's showing that something other than light industrial or industrial will, will be there in the future. Um, as was mentioned, I remember when I worked for the city back in the 90s, we, we had a pretty detailed concept plan for mixed use of Union Pier. Of course, that has never occurred. And, and right now, the Ports Authority has engaged uh, professional um, advisors to help them with their own thinking about the use of the property. And, and I agree with our planning department that um, this, this piece of property is so important. It should be a, a public and community um, um, 
have community input as to the future use of, of the property. So a, it seems like a good solution here to call it a future planning area, knowing that we've we've got some work to do to come back to this. Council Member Dale Shapo. Um, and I, I very much agree with everything you just said, Mayor. I think this is, you know, this is widely accepted and folks feel comfortable with this. Um, you know, when people were seeing industrial, it was kind of a, you know, they were being taken aback a little bit. And I think this is exactly what the comprehensive plan does. It's more of a future looking document. And, and so we're recognizing a future use here without getting super specific at this point. And I think the community engagement moving forward in this is going to be very important. Um, so I, I think this is, this is a really incredible, um, you know, label for us to put on it. Absolutely. Great. Great. All right. Anybody else on this issue of Union Pier? All right. Back to you, Robert or Christopher. Okay. We'll go on to the next slide. So um, then a, another area in downtown that had some questions, and we had meetings with our council representatives from this area uh, to discuss it, was the fact that in the um, current version that you know was endorsed by a planning commission and um, came to you all in the public hearing, we had left off the city center designation for Lower King and Lower Meeting and Broad Street. And we had done that because we felt like the um, neighborhood designation that we were applying to this still would allow for the types of densities and things that have been found in those areas already. Um, but upon hearing from, you know, in our public hearing, we heard from a number of preservation advocacy organizations, both pre pre preservation adv advocacy organizations, as well as our council members, that there were concerns about that. We have put forward this modified uh, um, version that has the frontages along King Street and Meeting Street and Broad Street uh, now back in this uh, city center area. So the Four Corners is back in the city center area. Um, and I think this is in line with you know what we heard from those council members and the advocacy organizations. And I will just throw this out for comment or thoughts. Councilmember Dale Shafo again. I feel like this entire list is all district one. <laughs> so, and yes, Christopher, y'all, y'all got it. This is exactly the, um, the you know issue we raised, and I think this is this is perfect with what's in there and um, you know intended to go in there. So appreciate it. And, and I, I think appropriate as well, mm -hmm. particularly coming all the way down to the four corners of law and the courthouses. It, it really is a, a city center feel. I'm down here most every day. And uh, um, I, re I remember back in, again, back to the 90s when Mayor Riley um, um, worked so hard with the county to keep the county courthouse uh, downtown and in this block. And um, you know, to, to, to acknowledge that this is a important commercial and city center portion of our city, I, I think it's appropriate. All right, any other comments on this one? Let's keep on rolling. Okay. So um, we had also heard a good bit about the need to integrate tourism management into this document. And of course, as we do with plans, as I was saying a few minutes ago, when we do adopt new plans, we do typically adopt them as uh, uh, element of our comprehensive plan. But what we were suggesting uh, in reference to tourism management when those comments were coming towards the comp plan is that, again, from a 30,000 foot level, it's difficult to get into those types of detailed questions and issues. So we felt it was better to make recommendations for an update of the tourism management plan, which this document does. And the, the recommendations are that it also be part of an updated downtown plan which could look at tourism management, barrier protection around downtown, the changes we've seen in downtown over the last 20 years, because it's really been more than 20 years since our plan was last updated. And so what this graphic is showing is kind of the hierarchy here that we see is the comprehensive plan on the left. And it, it is kind of the, the granddaddy of all the plans. And then it incorporates the downtown plan as present or future update and then into the tourism management. 
And so we have put in a budget request for fiscal year 2022 uh, to in include an update of that downtown plan. And of course, we would suggest that the tourism management strategy be updated with that. Any thoughts or comments? It seems reasonable to me. Uh, Commissioner Jacobs. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I think this is an excellent idea too, because I have some future questions about just plans, additions in general, but I might suggest that we don't just call it the downtown plan if we're looking at tourism management, because with the advocation of short-term rentals moving out into the suburbs and other little spots in the city where um, there are little tourism hotspots, we might want to expand the focus of that. I just wanted to put that on the thought table. Okay. Uh, Council Member Del Chapo. Mine is more of a procedural. So when you adopt a, a comprehensive plan, what happens to then things that come after? Can they then be rolled into the like whatever comp plan we're working in within the 10 years? Correct. Yes. Okay. And that is very typical that with our smaller area plans, like a downtown plan, is that when those come to you all for ultimate adoption, we adopt them as part of the, the, the citywide comprehensive plan. Okay. So could I ask, how do we define downtown these days from a planning <laughs> perspective? <laughs> so Mr. Mayor, Mayor, that's a great question. And that'll be one of the questions we'll need to answer if we get the funding for this project. A large, excuse me, a large part of our conversation internally has been Downtown is no longer as it was defined under the currently adopted downtown plan. Downtown has really grown to encapsulate the peninsula, if you would. And so that'll be a big part of that conversation is what are the geographic uh, limits of downtown um, and how does that all work together uh, in a, you know, some kind of integrated plan that addresses these sometimes complex issues that affect how downtown works. So that'll be one of the big questions that we need to answer as a part of that planning effort is what really is downtown in 2022 going forward versus what it looked like in 1999. Commissioner Harrison. You're on mute. You're mute. Just following up on that question regarding um, what is downtown? I know that we, we've got our, I know we have the Spring Canyon Corridor plan. Um, we've had, you know, the, I think we even have that affordable housing study plan that looked at that, you know, looked at some of those areas. And so if we're taking a look at that downtown plan and redefining that, um, are you, are we also going to um, look at, you know, the implementation of our, our former plans, you know, you know, like the character appraisals and how that is operating because, you know, we're looking at preservation in downtown and how that, you know, that creep between old city district and old historic district and what's that look like. So in that swath of that downtown, I know we're talking about tourism management here, but the full scope of that, are, I mean, I, I think a little bit more detail on that would be really important because there are so many tight micro plans, I would call them for downtown that um, and their implementation and the uh, pace at which they were implemented um, I, is, is something that I think, you know, we kind of need to look at a little bit closer. Good point. So um, if I may observe, this came up a month or so ago when there was an unfortunate um, crime event that occurred way up on the peninsula, um, what I would still call the neck area, and um, the, the, the TV reported it as an uh, incident that occurred downtown. And I'm like, I don't think of that as being downtown. Uh, you know, I think of the commercial district mostly. So um, maybe the Peninsula, Charleston Peninsula plan uh, will be more appropriate, it just depending on how you define it and how far up you go. Um, but I would also add the caveat as, um, uh, Commissioner Jacobs did, that when you do the tourism management strategy, that it's not necessarily limited to 
um, the peninsula or to downtown. There's tourism that occurs all over our city and, uh, you know, Charlestown Landing, Angel Oak. Um, so um, with the caveat that the tourism management strategy or strategies includes uh, really all parts of our city, um, I, I think this is a good direction as well. Council Member Jackson. Yeah, and just to um, build on that, Mayor, I mean, I, I think when you're talking about tourism and fostering uh, the opportunities for, for, you know, visitors to return over and over and over again to Charleston, which is, you know, I think a goal, it, we, we really, we, we need to give, um, I think, some attention and priority to how we can layer together uh, city tourism features, attractions, magnets with, with what's going on in the county and the other municipalities that, you know, we're, we're, we're stakeholders within the region. So that, that seems like many layers, but it would be opportunistic to have um, wherever we're talking about a, a particular opportunity outside the peninsula that we do mostly control, that we make sure we're grabbing on to the tourism um, you know, amenities that are, that are not under city jurisdiction. Right. Thank you. All right, anybody else got a comment, suggestion, question on this one? Okay. I think if you're attentive to uh, some of those remarks, this, this is a good path forward. Um, Christopher, next. All right. So then um, moving off of the peninsula, we had some questions, I believe, from Council Member Sheely about the uh, Ashley River Road corridor and the future land use that's in the, the currently drafted comprehensive plan. And uh, this is that area that I think he had some questions about. So we were going to have a little discussion on it. Um, what we're showing along this corridor, and I know the area he's most concerned with is the 61 corridor, the old 61 corridor with the um, two lane, mostly two lane road. Um, is the, the, the frontages along this two lane road. And what we were designated in the document is our neighborhood edge uh, category, which is uh, basically a uh, six to 20 units an acre category. And part of the reason we did designate it with that type of um, density is that uh, I'm gonna go to a map next. Let's see, there we go. I'm gonna jump ahead. Whoops, lost my map. Oops. Uh, uh, now we're really kind of wanting to jump through here. Um, I am not seeing my, here, here we go. Okay, I don't know why I was jumping over this. So this is a map of the current zoning in this corridor. And this corridor is roughly 70% in the city and about 30% in the county. And those properties that are in the city already have a good bit of density. They are um, at densities of 19 units an acre to 26 units an acre. They have de zoning designations on the ground at present, such as general business in red, limited business in the deeper red, um, DR1 and DR1F, which is 19.4 units an acre. Those are the yellowish colors along through here. And then the areas that are in brown are in Charleston County jurisdiction. And those are typically uh, neighborhood commercial or community commercial and have a designation of about 12 units an acre in those areas. So in our minds, that was fitting within the category of the neighborhood edge of no more, no let, no more than uh, 20 units an acre, but typically somewhere between six and 20 units an acre. And our general policy also has been in areas over the last 10 years or so when we annex to match the density that's in the county. So if these areas are at, you know, 12 units an acre from Charleston County, we would bring them in to say like a DR9, a DR12, if they were going to a commercial, to a residential designation, or if they were going to a commercial designation, probably something like CT, um, not as intense as the GB that was in here a good bit in the past. Um, and, um, you know, uh, maybe if there were some uses that wouldn't fit within CT, a limited business or something like that. But we felt like we were being very um, reflective of the existing uh, 
property rights of owners in the area with this designation and also respecting you know what had been designated in the county this way we are acutely aware of the traffic issues in this area and what you were seeing jump ahead in here i think it's here is a letter that mayor tecklenburg sent to um, secretary hall of the scdot uh, asking that we study this ashley river road area to see if there's safety improvements and and capacity things that could be done um, to help us with some of these issues, because we feel as planners that there are a lot of opportunities in this area to do extra lane for turn lanes, things like that, that wouldn't impact that big tree canopy, but that could help the traffic move a little bit better and definitely be safer in this area. And so we are optimistic that, you know, the mayor's request can ultimately lead to some improvements out here from a transportation standpoint. And that coupled with the development entitlements already in place out there, you know, made us feel like we were kind of striking a correct balance for the designations along Ashley River Road. But we are happy to discuss further and um, I will go back to just these two maps here for any further discussion. And if, if I might, I think we'd also be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the fact that, you know, we, we have heard that the capacity out here in the future may be more limited. And so as a result of that, you know, this is no longer designated highway. This is that neighborhood edge, which is a less intense category than it has previously while being respectful of those existing zoning rights that those property owners are entitled to. So... Um, just, I, I want to make sure that that's clear as well. Like, it's not that we didn't hear that concern about um, the intensity of future development. We did, we did in fact hear that. And so this category, I think Christopher pointed out, does strike that balance, if you would, between the existing rights that exist uh, for those zoning categories uh, with, you know, a de-emphasis on intensity going from that highway designation down to this neighborhood edge designation. And can, Robert, can I just suggest for clarity, as since people are watching on YouTube that I, I saw in the letter, it, we're talking about between um, Paul Cantrell on the south or whatever direction we call that and Bees Ferry on the north. So we're not talking about the historic corridor of Ashley River Road. I think that's important for people to no, um, this is already a, a determined suburb area of Charleston from long ago. Correct. And by the way, I'll share that um, uh, Secretary Hall responded favorably, and um, I don't have a timeline on it, but she did agree to um, um, do such a um, study and implementation plan for, for that section of 61. Councilmember Sheely. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you, Mr. Morgan, Mr. Summerfield. I appreciate um, all your work at looking at this. Um, I did want to clear up one thing. Um, Councilmember Jackson, um, this is between, this is on the Ashley River Road side. This is not the Glen McConnell side here. So it's Ashley River Road. It's actually between Magwood and Bees Ferry Road, I guess. Um, or you know, Magwood and Pierpont Road, um, those those roads. Um, the um, you know I, I know y'all have heard Keith Benjamin say before you know how bad this traffic is. I mean it's, it's a it's an E out of an A through F, and how it's not an F, I don't know. I mean I can tell you with a child that plays three three high school sports that I'm all over the place at high traffic area, and this is the worst. I, I don't care what studies you do. I've been down every road in the city of Charleston, and this is the worst traffic in the city of Charleston. How it's an E and not an F, I have no idea because it is absolute gridlock around here. And I would just ask that, you know, as the planning commission sees things coming that way, that they will consider that. And, you know, we need businesses along here. We don't need condos, apartments, and homes being built down here because there's nowhere for those people to go. And we continue to allow that type of building to go on. And, you know, it, it is horrible that we're doing that to the residents that live down there. And it's bad for the person that doesn't know yet that is moving into that condo apartment or house. But I, I, I appreciate, you know, the mayor, um, Mayor Tecklenburg sending that letter as well. 
I think that they're going to be very limited on what they can do there because of the Grand Oaks along that road. Yeah, it's not out toward the gardens, Council Member Jackson, but there is, as Mr. Morgan said, a canopy of trees there of Grand Oaks that I'm not sure that that road can be widened or, the, or it's very limited on what they can do there. So I hope the Planning Commission will consider that when you see any kind of residential go in there because we need good businesses along there to, to help control that traffic. And um, that's why I'm so, you know, I hope that you'll strongly consider anything you can do to limit that traffic. So thank you, thank Mr. You. Mayor. And, and yes, yes, sir. Thank you. Commissioner Lempesis. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, to Mr. Sheely's point, um, we will have to change ordinances um, and zoning rules on general business, et cetera, in order to accomplish what you are asking. Um, we are not able to just selectively not vote for residential if it is allowed in that zoning. So we have to have a discussion about taking general business and not allowing the residential in that component, which used to be considered down zoning, now it's considered increased zoning. So I think that's that we have to do that before we can do what you've asked. Mm. And Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Gregory is trying to speak. Yes, Councilmember Gregory. Sorry, I didn't see you. Yes, um, it's something that I think I know the answer to, but just for clarity, can you distinguish for me? um the difference between neighborhood and suburban yes sir yes sir so they are different density gradients in the plan and so i'm going to read to you from the um document here as far as the um, recommended categories here um we have i should have this turned to the right page so suburban is typically four to eight units an acre. It's similar to our SR1 type zoning in the city. And then our uh, neighborhood uh, designation is six to 12 units an acre. And then the neighborhood edge is six to 20 units an acre. And uh, typically the neighborhood edge is on the edge of these neighborhoods and is along corridors that you know are kind of major collectors, things like that. So density is a part of it? I'm sorry? Density is a part of that definition? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Council Member Sacron and then Commissioner Jacobs. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a quick question going back to Councilman Sheely's question. And I think Ms. Limpesis added <clears throat> as a new council member, you know, trying to understand the process when, when she had suggested that we'd, we'd have to rezone that some eyes lit up. Um, is that it, can someone explain that process and why that would be difficult to, to do now uh, to, to, to further prevent any of the concerns that Councilman Sheely has articulated? If you, so, can, if you can describe it in, in, in short, in short. Sure, sure. So the situation we're kind of faced with is the existing development entitlements. So as you look through here, like for instance, this is a large track. It currently has a good bit of storage on it, mini storage, things like that. Well, if the owner of this track wanted to take out that storage and put in, you know, uh, residential, they could do that under their current zoning at 26 units an acre, because that's what's allowed in general business. In um, an area like this that's limited business, if there were current uses that they wanted to take out and rebuild with, they could go in with 19.4 units an acre in a place like that. Now, just as Mr. Sheely said, we'd love to see commercial uses come into some of these areas and, and certainly are working to try to get commercial uses throughout West Ashley to serve all the residents out there. But you know, the current zoning does allow a good bit in these areas. Now, as we move forward with a new zoning ordinance, and again, that's one of our budget requests for next year is to be able to rewrite our zoning ordinance being elevation-based, we're also looking at just a complete reforming of the zoning ordinance. And I know we've talked a good bit about in a future zoning category, in future zoning categories, we would make sure that 
to get density, you would have to, you know, pass certain tests like is there, you know, affordable housing on a site or something like that, that there might be bonuses for affordable housing and all. So it could be possible that with rewriting our zoning code that we reduce the the amount of density in some of those pre-existing categories. But at present, those property owners have those rights. And of course, to change the zoning ordinance in that way would potentially take away some property owner rights. And that, you know, is uh, decisions you all will have to balance as we bring changes like that forward to you with the new zoning ordinance. But at present, there are a lot of entitlements in areas like this that are have a lot of pre-existing zoning. Is that kind of answering your question? Yeah, I think that answers the question. Commissioner Jacobs, then Lempis's, then Council Member Appel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to echo what Commissioner Lippis has said about this. We actually took this up in a workshop maybe two years ago with Council looking at these residential subzonings in general business and limited business and tried to separate them. And we, you know, ran up against the concerns that we're talking about right now. And so I would strongly petition Council to consider you know, including a zoning rework in this year's budget for this and many other reasons that we're probably not going to go into today. I think this is a very important discussion that we're having right now. And in addition, there's um, a little educational tool that I've been made aware of. It's a little YouTube video called Guess the Density that I've been very, very much encouraging the city to build on. Maybe we could go to the Preservation Society to get some money to do this to because it would be, you would be very surprised at how density translates into development. And you'll probably guess most of them wrong because I did. And I think if we build that for the city, we can educate ourselves, we can educate our public and, and probably move forward in a very good direction with this discussion that we're having right now. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Lemesis. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, my thoughts would, in, in addition to um, suggesting that residential not be a part of a general business light industrial or industrial zoning, we would then put in a caveat that if workforce housing and affordable housing is completed, then they then have the exception to that rule. Um, I agree 100% that we should encourage and not just make it a part of that you can do 20% of your apartments have to be affordable or workforce housing. I think if they only do workforce and affordable housing, then that's allowed in those zonings. But Christopher, I understand what you're saying. It, 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 it's a taking at times, um, but we do need to encourage general business and businesses and commercial to be less, less services for us. And there's so many positives and we seem to be losing that. Thank you. I'm going to say bravo to that. Uh, Council Member Appel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And first, I want to say, um, Councilman Sheely, I sympathize with your concerns. I uh, grew up in West Ashley, very familiar with this part 61. The traffic was crazy when I was a kid, and it's gotten worse um, over, over time. And, and this is a very interesting discussion, but I want to say a couple things here. Um, you know, certain terms get thrown around when you have these discussions like entitlement and takings and things of that nature, there's a colloquial political use of those terms. And then there's like a real technical legal use of those terms. And I'll tell you this right now, nobody has an entitlement to develop anything based on a property zoning. Okay. I want to say that again, nobody has a development right, a vested right or an entitlement to zoning. The way you get an entitlement in South Carolina is you put forward specific plans, you get those plans approved and site specific development plans under the Vested Rights Act. That's what entitles you to property. So the storage owner that's zone GB that's been in the storage business for who knows how many years, if we were to take away the residential development rights from that property in the absence of a site specific development plan, that owner has no claim against the city of Charleston. So the concern I've got here, though, is, you know, GB exists downtown, West Ashley, Johns Island, right? So we, if we want to go in surgically here along Ashley River Road, where I agree there's a real problem, we got to do it with an overlay. We can do that tomorrow. We can get moving on that ASAP. We don't need a whole scale zoning rewrite. Charleston County 
has an overlay zone for Ashley River Road. They don't always live up to it and enforce it properly, in my humble opinion, but we could easily develop a um, overlay zone in the city of Charleston along the most problematic areas for traffic along Highway 61, as Councilman Shealy pointed out, that simply takes by right residential out of the equation. And for the people that are vested and for the people that are in the middle of the development review process, they're protected. But I'm here to tell you, I wanna be very clear about this. That is not a takings. You don't have entitlements based upon zoning. These are things that are frankly used to, um, you know, kind of kind of scare people from taking action in these areas. But if we want to, we are absolutely within our power to do that. And Councilman Sheely, if you wanna do that, I'd be happy to support it and we can make that happen because I agree with you. Um, we need to be encouraging commercial development, office development, things of that nature along these corridors. So the people that already live in this community don't have to truck into downtown every day during storms and things of that nature, right? They can go to work closer to where they live. That's what we need to be doing. We don't need a million dollar zoning rewrite to do this. You know, we don't need to be afraid of takings. We don't need to be afraid of all these other things. We just got to get our pencils out and, and do this. We did an overlay zone on King Street um, earlier this year for parking. Uh, we can do something very similar um, in this area. And I think that um, that would be the right thing to do, frankly. So just wanted to add some thoughts as the Thank you. local councilman slash land use attorney. Thanks. Thank you. Good idea. Council member Gregory. Yeah, I wanted to go back to uh, Councilman Sacrin's question because the way I understood his question was why can't we put those zoning changes in this document? Um, and for clarity, um, it would not be appropriate in the planning document to start making um, zoning changes. The zoning changes uh, may, may come as a result of the planning document, but, but this document is not specifically to do zoning changes. And I just want to make sure that I'm clear on that. Um, because I, that's how I understood Councilman uh, Sacrin's question. Why couldn't we do it now during the planning process, make any zoning changes? And I don't think that this document does that or is supposed to do that. And just for clarity, can somebody speak to that for me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So yes, this document can lead to ultimate zoning changes and overlay districts and things like that. Absolutely. Uh, these are just the kind of recommendations based on what we're seeing on the ground and what we're seeing in our surrounding jurisdictions, things like that. Well, let me ask you this, based upon this conversation, would it, would it for the purposes of the comprehensive plan, would it make sense for the comprehensive plan to recommend um, the addition of an overlay district uh, along this section of 61 and to be um, and to work um, collaboratively with with the county of Charleston and their overlay district that would have certain goals as has been stated to uh, encourage business and perhaps um, um, to disallow the residential entitlement. Councilmember Waring. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Listen, I, Councilman Shealy has been ringing that bell uh, for a while. Uh, we, uh, Council, have, uh, in sympathy, have voted along with him because he's right on the issue. This is a special area, um, in particular from Magwood Road up to, uh, I would say, Church Creek along uh, 61. And what Councilman Appel just suggested is a solution. In other words, we can actually have a solution with this overlay district. Um, by ordinance, we were the one, not we, but previous councils that put the residential component in um, general business and the limited business. And we've certainly gotten bitten on that. You know, I, I think about the, the movie theater over on James Island. When they sold the movie theater on James Island over there, it was on general business, neighborhood and community over there didn't want you know, I don't know, 200 apartment units, but you know what, we can do a, a doggone thing about it because our ordinance gave them uh, certain rights to do it. So um, in this process, I hope we would revisit that residential component um, being in uh, general business. And you're right, Councilman uh, Pale, about obviously applies to the whole city, 
But that overlay and, I, and, and, and Commissioner um, Jacobs knows about, it. I think one of the first overlay districts we did in the city of Charleston and Commissioner Lim says you can straighten me up, may have been that over there in, um, was it the Ashley River District over there? It burns down in, in South Windermere over in that area, you know, um, which seems to be close to a couple of decades ago now. 1997, Councilman Waring. Well, thank you so much. But if, if there's an area that should not have condos and apartments uh, lined up along 61, can you imagine if somebody, let's just say this um, storage unit that uh, Mr. Morgan pointed out were sold and um, I don't know, 200 units or 200 plus units were to be placed here. Can you imagine those people getting ingress and egress on 61 in the middle of that block right there away from an intersection? You're not going to get another intersection as close to the associated as Dogwood and 61 right now. But what Councilman Appel spoke about, that overlay, that's something we can get working on now, Councilman Sheely, Ross, Appel, um, Dudley, Gregory, everybody on him. I mean, that can, I would think, could be put in place, certainly prior to years in. Um, but anyway, uh, that's a solution. And hopefully yeah. through these workshops, we come away with action steps versus a good hearty conversation. I love those hearty conversations, but the action steps are where we feel a sense of accomplishment. Thank you, Mr. Me. Yes, sir. Uh, Commissioner Harrison. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, Councilman Appel is correct. I, I think this is where, you know, you start, uh, you know, looking at solutions and I do suggest that as if if you all start looking at an overlay because this document is supposed to be a 10 year out kind of you know projection as to how do we envision it and and you know I've seen overlays and how you know moratoriums work and 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 how and how those things can be almost problematic um, but also you know provide a good solution um, if you're looking at trying to reduce that GB, what's gonna end up happening is that you're going to start seeing that kind of a domino effect where everybody else wants the same exact type of solution. And what will end up happening is um, we, it may become almost a one trick pony. Um, and so I, I think this is a good step and process, but we also need to look at, look at it in terms of walkability for people because now you've got housing, there should be businesses. And so even in the way you kind of like look at an overlay and excluding and allowing for housing, be it workforce or, you know, naturally occurring, but also looking kind of at these walkability scores, because I think that's what people really do want. They want to be able to walk outside and go get their groceries or, or do the activities that they, they, they want to do. So um, I, I do think this is where some of that where where in this workshop i think we can get solutions but i and I, I do caution against also just trying to like do a wholesale solution and and the uh, impacts that it has down the future in 10 years thank you so if i may uh, make a few comments myself i would again um, ask if there's consensus that we add to the comprehensive plan a uh, request for an overlay district um, Council Member Appel and Sheely may get it uh, to council before even the comprehensive plan passes, but I, I think that would add some consistency um, to have it both in a comprehensive plan and, and then to do it. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, also, I wanted to go back for, for a moment to comments from both uh, Commissioner Jacobs and Lempesis. Um, and Donna, um, if I remember correctly, you referenced the, um, the joint meeting we had, the workshop, when we were looking at the residential entitlements. At that point, it was for light and heavy industrial properties. This is and, correct. Um, the same thing, though, applies here to light uh, business, limited business, and general business. And, and you all know, I mean, it's clear in the document uh, we, we, I think we're all on the same page. We need more affordable housing in this city. And if, if we tried to, you know, surgically uh, remove that entitlement for light industrial and heavy industrial 
by that workshop process we went through. And unfortunately, we got hung up on a couple of properties and the whole thing kind of fell apart and never passed. But, but what I'm here and maybe a path forward is um, in order to have a handle on future residential development and, um, um, and to promote affordable and attainable housing. And if council member Appel is correct, and I believe he is, that if we remove the, the uh, allowance for, for properties that, that haven't developed yet, that don't have a site specific plan, um, you know, we could remove or greatly reduce the residential entitlement for light, heavy industrial, limited and general business, not saying we won't allow um, a residential development in the right place, but it should come with some incentive for affordable housing, just like we have with our uh, workforce uh, housing uh, zoning de designation. We'll give somebody some density if they'll provide us um, either a fee in lieu or some affordable units, right? Same concept. And uh, we, we could apply that across all these zoning uh, categories. I think that makes a lot of sense. I don't hear, I see some heads nodding. <laughs> so um, I, don't, I don't know if, you, if, if we wanna write that into the comprehensive plan or just come back when you redo the whole zoning and do it then, Robert. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm tired of, of, of a site like that, not to pick on the storage unit. That's a pretty good size site there, Councilmember Wary. You could probably end up with 350 units on that site. Um, you know, it's probably well over 10 acres. So um, anyway, um, I'd, I'd like to think that would be a good, healthy path forward for us. Council member, I mean, um, uh, Commissioner Lassane and then Council Member Waring. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And, and briefly, it, it seems to me that some of the precedents that have been cited here for good planning initiatives that have led to overlay districts, the Ashley Bridge District, I also point to one uh, that was recently done that a lot of folks on this uh, in this meeting participated in, the Folly Road Overlay District. Uh, you know. I think this, this area will require some very site specific planning, looking at each particular property. And so I think being very careful with what we do is important. I know, I know there's a desire for speed, but um, I think you know, we just need to be very careful about how we proceed. So I would, I would recommend a, a, a process like those that we've undergone in the past. Yes, sir. Council, Council Member Waring. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to second what you said. I mean, the thought about uh, removing some of these aspects and bringing them back, if we do with a residential component that requires uh, more diverse housing uh, for the population that we serve. I mean, it's getting to the point to where we all have the sidebar conversations. I don't know how much longer Charlestonians are going to be able to live in Charleston. I mean, I, you know, I, there was a time when I think City Hall is symbolic of that. I don't know that we have an employee that works in City Hall that actually lives on the peninsula. Um, and that price appreciation for various reasons is spreading out in all directions. And, you know, West Ashley used to be the affordable option. It's not so much the affordable option anymore. And our, our, our census data shows us that. So anyway, I think, uh, again, some of what you said certainly should be hopefully attempted in action steps when we come to rewriting some of this. Because develop, Ashley River Road was never designed for what it's becoming out there. Let's put it like that. It wasn't designed for the storage shed thing that's out there. But anyway, it's there. So we have to deal with it. But anyway, um, I agree with what you said. And I, hopefully that can go into an action step. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, any other comments, uh, suggestions about this 61 area or residential densities, I guess, in general? All right, back to you, Mr. Morgan. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll work up a extra recommendation in our land use area that talks about working with our neighborhoods and our council members on uh, um, overlay in this area, so. 
and with the county, of course, too. So thank you. All right. Yes, sir. All right. So now we're going to look a little bit at the uh, Keen Hoy area where there were some other questions in reference to the plan. Um, just again, this is the uh, upper Keen Hoy area, and uh, this is Clements Ferry Road running out here. This is Keen Hoy Road, which runs roughly here. The Francis Marion Forest is in this area. The old Keen Hoy Village is in this area, as well as older settlement areas that we've identified in the plan. We also have the settlement area of the Jack Primus neighborhood and surrounding areas and some other older um, uh, settlement areas. I believe Summer House may be one over here. So definitely a lot of history in this area. Um, the Kane Hoy development itself has had a number of questions in reference to it. Um, of course, a good bit of this area is heavily impacted by um, where we see, you know, ultimate marsh migration going because of sea level rise. And uh, the areas that are in the darker green here are the um, low impact conserved areas that, you know, could see regular tidal inundation in 20 or 30 years. And the folks with the Kane Hoy development are aware of that. And, you know, they are adjusting their plans accordingly. Um, of course, they have a development agreement that's based on a PUD for this area uh, that does have a tremendous amount of entitlements and we've had meetings with them in reference to all this. Um, they are in the Point Hope development, which is part of the Kane Hoy development uh, in this area here. They are working to get a good bit of density along Clements Ferry Road, which is not only some of the highest land in the city, but also is an area that potentially could have good transit service. If we had enough density along this area of Clements Ferry, we might even get to a point where we could have like a bus rapid transit, something, you know, a, a good year, a good ways out in the future, but something that could be aspired to as a way to help mitigate some of that crush of traffic that currently hits Clements Ferry Road itself. Um, and in this plan document, of course, we're showing a kind of feathering out of these densities. This is city center within a half mile or so of Clements Ferry Road in through here on the King Hoy development. Uh, it feathers out to just the regular suburban category out here and then feathers out to the at the edge of our urban growth boundary to our suburban edge, which is near the urban growth boundary and lots of other areas of the city, Johns Island example, um, uh, that would have the least intense development from one unit an acre to four units an acre. Um, we also uh, wanted to point out how um, the Kane Hoy development did have provisions, as I was saying, for the settlement areas. The next slide shows this is actually a slide from the PUD that was approved for Kane Hoy. Uh, this is Clements Ferry Road right here. Uh, the Jack Primus area is here. And if you'll notice this kind of area with the little hook on the end of it, this is a blow up of it here on the right side. And this was an area that's part of the Kane Hoy property, but that they were recommending and calling for in this PUD that could be uh, ultimate expansion of the Jack Primus area. It would be an area that would allow the same types of development that have occurred in Jack Primus, which is multiple family members on one parcel. It would include potentially, you know, manufactured housing, uh, just a variety of housing solutions uh, that you find in the Jack Primus area. And because it's immediately adjacent, it seemed like it, it made a lot of sense. It's also very close to the cemetery that of course would be preserved in this area and some of the most historic portions of the Kane Hoy development itself. So that's a little bit of background on how we've been kind of trying to, to, to balance things in this PUD, I mean, in this, in this plan um, in reference to, you know, Kane Hoy, because we have a development agreement that's in place. We have a PUD that's in place, but of course we would like to encourage, you know, that density of development along Clements Ferry and then the Kane Hoy development does not include areas that are around the old Kane Hoy village here. These areas are at much lower density. And this is the area where we've had the issues with the, the, the graves and other much tighter in uh, historic resources. And these are all in the area that's recommended for suburban edge. So a very low density in that Kane Hoy village area. And we felt like that was appropriate to the development pattern that's there. But be happy to answer other questions about Kane Hoy. I know we uh, met with Ms. Del Chapo a little bit and talked to her about some of these issues and, and um, 
you know, I think we've got a, a good path forward on this, but we're happy to answer questions or, or have further discussion. So Christopher, does what you just presented represent a change from what um, was in the plan before or you were just explaining? No, it? sir. It, it's what is already in the plan. Uh, the city center designation along Clements Ferry Road, feathering out to the, the suburban and then our suburban edge and all the provisions for Jack Primus and the Canehoy Village, these are all already in the document that Planning Commission recommended to you. Okay, great. Anybody have any comments, questions, thoughts? Uh, Councilmember Dale Shapo. And I think those those were some of the biggest things is those that transitioning between Jack Primus and Canehoy Village and um, we're able to you know, see those a little bit clearer. Um, and then also just through numerous conversations with folks in the area and landowners out there and um, a little bit better understanding and seeing plans and things like that. Um, and also just having a more up close and personal look at the topography. Um, it's, it gets really tricky back in there um, as far as all the wetlands are concerned. So, um, you know, I'm, I think I'm about as comfortable as I'm going to be, <laughs> um, you know, and, and I, I stated my case and uh, had some really difficult conversations. <laughs> so, but, um, but, but I'm okay with this going forward. And again, knowing that it's going to, it's going to go through our processes and community engagement and all of those things. All right. Thank you. Council member Jackson. Uh, th thank you, Mayor, and thank you, uh, Councilwoman Del Chapo, for you know um, setting the table for us. Obviously, you are the on the ground expert on you know what what the community is hoping to see us at least master plan in this uh, <laughs> sort of uncharted area. Other than the fact that a long time ago a PUD was delivered. So I, I guess um, knowing Robert, thank you that you um, also made it clear that you know the Dover Coal um, retrospective or whatever study that they were paid to do by by uh, the third party nonprofits who uh, no mystery are the conservation you know watchdogs of our region, um, and I'm personally very grateful to the way that they take on that responsibility out of their own resources. So um, I guess I'm 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 just curious, and maybe the way that the map reads here is the absolute final answer. But in terms of where did the waterland analysis really inform, you know, what what has already been approved under the PUD and the development agreement for the for the first you know big land use that we know is going to you know have um, probably the most immediate progress that. that Councilmember Del Chapo is going to be clear to, you know, be a, a an arbitrator for. Is is there any difference between what what's already there, and then if if we could, like, have a clean slate, um, would we make would we make recommendations for the land use differently based on the water land water analysis that uh, Wagner and Ball did? So. Councilman, yes. I think the answer to that question is yes. If we had had the land and water analysis that was conducted as a part of this process at the time that the prior PUD was done, I think the land use plan under the PUD would be different. Um, I think in more, and Mr. Morgan can go into this, I think in particular the area, and I'm pointing at my screen as if you guys can see where I'm pointing, but the area south of Clements Ferry, where we're showing that intensive marsh migration area, I think that is substantially different under what we saw under the, the land and water analysis versus uh, what was some land uses considered under the PUD. The great thing is that they, you know, and talking to and during the planning commission process for this, you know, it opened some dialogue between the city and the development um, team for Canehoy. Uh, that I think there's going to be some give and take there based on what we put here in the plan versus what, you know, those older PUD documents um, suggest. I think some of the most immediate stuff, again, will be 
along Clements Ferry, as, as Christopher has pointed out. That's where we're seeing the development occurring right now. Uh, we will see some more of that as they are continuing to look at their plan documents and doing their engineering and identifying um, you know, where roadways may go on the north side of Clements Ferry. I think that will continue to be a dialogue as we go forward. So I think there's definitely, this opens the door for some conversation that maybe didn't exist prior to um, doing the land and water analysis up here um, that can have some ongoing dialogue about maybe some modifications to that PUD um, as we move forward and they move forward with their development plans. Christopher, I don't know if you want to add on to that. Yeah, I just wanted to go kind of uh, move a slide ahead and show again. So one of the, the things about the land water analysis is, you know, again, this was done back in 2014, 2013. This is the, the PUD for Cane Hoy. And you don't see as much of the southern area based on the screenshot, but it was showing more suburban areas down here and the area that are now, you know, we know from a elevation standpoint is more problematic. This area is also somewhat problematic from an elevation standpoint. They were showing this as a um, North River village in here, but if you'll notice in this document, this is that same area. And we have noted that this is an area that has a lot of impact from um, uh, uh, the, the encroachment, encroaching uh, sea level rise and all that. So uh, they have seen this and know that we are calling for this area to maybe scale back some because of uh, elevation issues. This area is not as challenged from an elevation standpoint, but it is a good ways away from Clements Ferry. It is very close to the um, urban growth boundary. It has a lot of this old growth forest on it. So obviously if densities here could be maybe even focused more uh, further up, that would be great for everybody. And we would love to work with the development team there on how they could modify that PUD over time and, and achieve something that's more in line with you know the densities that we're talking about along Clements Ferry Road itself. Thank you. Thank you for all of that. And I, I guess I would just make a suggestion that, and, you know, based on some of the other topics that we've talked about today, that it, I, I, I think the master plan should represent, you know, our, our best thinking. Obviously, we spend a lot of our own um, hard-earned resources for the city to make it as expert on the, you know, on the conditions of on the ground that we're that we're now knowledgeable of, and we can't deny that knowledge, and we need to live into it. In my personal opinion, so can't can't we not um, adjust this section of the comp plan to say that we know that there's you know entitled um, um, approvals, but we're going to work our our best as a city of stewards of of land and the conservation goals that we have for especially land that's been designated, you know, concerning um, by our land and water analysis. Can we make some very clear reference to that? Uh, I, I, I would strongly, you know, appreciate being able to do that in a document that's going to be used by other um, future landowners. Yeah, I mean, if it's the will of council, we could certainly put a recommendation that you know we continue in all discussions with the the development team in reference to the Kane Hoy uh, development agreement and PUD that we continue to talk to them about all recommendations of the land and water analysis. We could certainly do something like that if if, if that's a consensus of council. Council Member Appel, I was just going to briefly say that. Um, you know, it was a little addendum to my discussion about vested rights earlier that vested rights in South Carolina only stop the subsequent enactment and application of zoning regulations to an entitled property. Stormwater regulations are not zoning regulations. So I just put that out as food for thought. Um, I don't think the fact that um, obviously the development out in Cane Hoy is entitled um, with development agreement and PUDs, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the city is prevented from doing anything to impact or modify um, certain aspects of the development, so long as it complies with South Carolina law. But, but vesting is not a total um, bar to the subsequent um, 
regulations, including stormwater regulations, particularly in light of what we know today versus what we know, what we knew maybe a decade or more or so ago. Thanks. Good point. Councilmember Del Chapo. Um, I, I was going to say, aren't those types of, um, you know, aren't things like that done as you move through the TRC process, et cetera? Would it already be folded in? Correct. The stormwater review definitely is, is folded into that. Um, I guess what I was making reference to is if they were going to kind of, you know, work on some changes here or uh -huh. future planning of other areas out here that we keep encouraging them from the standpoint of our recommendations in the land and water analysis to, you know, reflect the, that, that all their future layouts reflect that. Right. And I mean, and, and just keeping in mind, you know, there is not one owner out here. Um, and that's something else I think that a lot of folks are not aware of. It's not one ownership group out here. There's actually three. Um, and we tend to focus on just the one. So um, I, I, I just want to make sure that one specifically is not being called out when we're talking about an entire area. Um, and interestingly enough, the one that we're calling out is, is drawn in more towards the center. Um, so I, I want to make sure we're not, again, that we're, I want to make sure everything's being applied equally. Um, so if something already exists in a, in a TRC process or something like that, I, I don't think it needs to be called out again. Um, and if there is something that should be called out separately, I want to make sure it's, it's, it's amongst all of the, the entities in this, in this area. I, I it, think that was council member Jackson's intent. Okay. Yes, absolutely. In the, in the framework of a master plan, um, but, but to show the emphasis that we've now, you know, generated by learning from the, the, the consulting team that we paid to study the land use in, in the putting water first, as the um, directions say at the beginning of our, of our document. So thank, thank you, Council Member Del Chapo. I really appreciate your, your um, understanding, you know, sort of my vague yeah. um, sentiments. And I think, Councilmember Jackson, what you're proposing is is a guiding principle of the overall comprehensive plan everywhere in the city. Um, you know, but I understand to have a little um, extra emphasis here um, or reminder under the circumstances, um, you know, could be appropriate. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Um, Commissioner Lassane, I'm not sure if you never took your hand down or if you got something else for us, you're good. Council Member Mitchell? Yes, I want to ask a quick question. Uh, uh, okay, although we're doing the, all this, have, are we going to have any problems going through the census in the city of Charleston, but it's in the county of Berkeley, it's in Berkeley County. You know, when I really uh, represent, that, represent that area back in, way back when, 97, 98, 99, you know, it was a little different over there, even with the Ken Hart Village area and the Dan Daniels Island area. And I fought to keep that area uh, with, with the zoning so far as not building out. And uh, we went to court and I fought in court to keep it to only two units or two and a half units per acre during that time. And that's how that came about during that time. Cause otherwise they wanted to have four to five units per acre when it was building out. And we went to court and fight it we fought it and uh, I was the person that fought all the attorneys and got it done during that time with the council that we had in place. So if, since we are, like I said, in the city of Charleston and we're dealing with Berkeley County, is Berkeley County gonna have any things to do with all the zoning part that we might have to do in that particular area? Well, Councilman, um, all of the Canehoy development is in the city. And so this PUD came through the city process and then there still is some of that old Canehoy zoning along in this area where it's two units an acre here. And actually the whole Canehoy PUD was based on the premise of two units an acre as well. 
Um, but there is also on the ground zoning over here that uh, is near Kanehoy Village that is no more than two units an acre in here and reflected in our plans as well. The county still, there still are some areas in the county, I believe the Nelly Field development, which is I believe right around in here is still in the county. Uh, although we do see some annexations, it's actually fully built out, um, but we, we ultimately may annex some of that. And then we do see in the old Canehoy Village area, a good bit of land that is still in Berkeley County. And, you know, we continue to work with them. We have a very good dialogue with their planning department and they consult with us on a lot of things out here. And so um, I think that they've taken a lot of care to that Canehoy Village area. There are some other developments that were approved a while back in areas along of Berkeley County as you get further down here towards Clements Ferry I mean right. towards uh, 526 that gives some pause but I think the county has worked very well in this the Canehoy Village area okay all Thank right you. any more discussion on Canehoy area up here from anyone questions all right Thank you, Mr. Morgan. What else we got? Okay. Well, essentially, we were just going to kind of outline what we saw as the next steps here. Um, we were hoping to have, you know, second and third reading on this document, the plan document before you all on October 12th. Um, we will add the items that we've discussed this afternoon that, that we've gotten consensus from you all on. Um, and um, then assuming that, you know, things move forward on the 12th, you know, then our staff moves into our you know phase of plan implementation we already are you know looking ahead as we've said already about the 2022 budget requests for uh, funding for downtown plan and zoning code rewrite um, we also want to have regular planning department public outreach on the status of the plan implementation we haven't really done that as well in the past and that's something we want to keep up at the top of our kind of um, um, uh, project list is that we're going to regularly report back to the community. We want to have an online public data dashboard tracking the progress of this plan, showing how we're helping to implement it and trying to get the public to have a little bit more ownership of what is our, you know, would be our new city plan and, and have understanding of it. So um, that those are some of the things that we're really going to be working towards. But we are happy to answer other questions about other parts of the plan or things that that we may have, have not noted that you all have concerns or questions about and would be happy to open the floor up to those. Commissioner Jacobs. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Toward that public data dashboard, that was a question that I had written down. I, is this what I heard earlier that there'd be a, a website type place where the plan sits you know, yes. where it could be easily seen digitally. And in addition, Absolutely. we reference a lot of, in, a, in an appendix, a lot of other plans. Will links be made possible yes. for all those other plans at the site that you're talking about? The entire document will be there. We'll just upgrade what has been our comprehensive plan website into this and uh, put the dashboard there and have regular updates. And yes, that's exactly the, the intent with that. And do we have a time frame when that might be accomplished, assuming we get second and third reading in October? We would Is like there... to do that over the next couple of months. Um, so... There may be some aspects of the dashboard that take a little bit longer, but we'd like to, again, regular public outreach, maybe quarterly reports to the community, to council, things like that on how we're implementing the plan. Absolutely. Okay, the, the biggest thing would just be getting the plan to where it's accessible to the public with all the links to the internal plans like the you know the fair housing plan the racial bias audit we mentioned the the web plan west ashley all of those sub links that are referenced in the document too and i believe all those are already linked on our current comp plan website uh, okay some of our staff may want to chime in on that chloe or, or uh, jim um, are kind of masters of what's on that site but um, i believe there already are uh, links to all of those, but we would absolutely keep those there and have it easily accessible for the public that anything they want to look up plan wise, planning wise in the city could all be in that one location. Perfect. Thank you so much. Great. Anybody else? Council Member Jackson. Uh, thank you. Th thank you, uh, Christopher, for putting the important next steps in front of us. I I'm sort of thinking about um, some of the let's just call them the, the softer um, 
you know, less um, uh, directive objectives like like looking at our zoning code very you know closely intentionally and rapidly as as it makes sense to do but some of the things that are um, going to receive more um, more scrutiny more research more support uh, I'm thinking in particular of the African American settlement communities and you know we began a process of of uh, working with those communities, understanding their history, understanding their hopes and dreams for how you know they want to um, retain identity on their land, but not being stuck in time. So, um, were you thinking maybe about establishing some ongoing advisory groups or task groups, or what? What's the overall plan for not not dropping a lot of balls that won't be the main you know, workload of the, of the planning staff directly over the next many months. Absolutely. Well, I think those, and, and I'll let uh, Mr. Summerfield chime in here if he wants to as well, but, you know, I think we are seeing those as um, uh, huge priorities. We definitely need some more research in all the settlement areas. We've had, as you all probably are well aware, an issue come up in one of the settlement areas in the last uh, couple of weeks in reference to uh, Camp Road and a historic structure there that it's definitely why I'm bringing is a it up. Yeah. defining element of a settlement area in that location. So the importance of getting some extra protections and study of those settlement areas has definitely been highlighted for us. And that would be some of the things we would be working on over the next six months too. So yes, Councilman, so that's that will be one of the implementation projects. In fact, Ms. Stuber is already well engaged in that. Um, we were already in conversations with the uh, Ashleyville, Maryville community specifically. Um, you know, the each of those settlement communities is unique. So there won't be a one size fits all approach that we can we can take. And so it will require a, a pretty intensive dialogue to continue with the communities. Um, additionally, you know, that research is not 100 percent. One of the things we found is there's a lot of information we don't know um, out there. There's a lot of smaller settlement communities we just weren't aware of. And so that will be an ongoing piece of work. I think it will uh, be something I, I know the team is passionate about. Um, but it will be intensive and very individual um, on what those solutions uh, that the communities are looking for, um, what are their protections, what are the options that they, they want to, as you said, maintain their identity, but also uh, potentially progress into, you know, future wealth creation for their, for their community. Um, with their land rights. And so, you know, we'll be taking those kind of as one-offs, but we'll, we'll be looking at hard at like every strategy that we can make available in the toolbox um, to address those. I mean, I appreciate you, you know, describing that it's going to be a priority, but again, I, I, I think that there's more common ground there. Yes, every, every location, every community, every history is unique and no question about that. And those and those those unique you know um, um, attributes and and historical uh, framing can't can't be short circuited. But I do feel like I mean I, as an example, I'm I represent the lower part of James Island, and there used to be one African American community that straddles both sides up around Battery Island connected originally to Saul Legree when they're literally the old Folly Road went across the marsh um, just to the west of Folly Road and basically um, connected right down to Saul Legree. So there's a lot of um, connectivity that is historic, but not, not very well um, identified by the governing authorities that, you know, literally control how they can use their land or any other opportunities for, you know, some sort of support services, grants. Um, so I do feel like, and I'm trying to get those, um, you know, people in their in their present day, um, you know, family identities, fourth, fifth, sixth generation to reconnect and find their common ground. So I think having that kind of vehicle that is a priority by the city, especially as we're declaring that that's a priority in a document like this, that we should be living into it. So I'm not going to, you know, like harp, harp on this any much, anymore right this minute, but I do feel like there is a lot of opportunity to um, 
to, to bring people together around their common, you know, backgrounds, concerns, and futures, and and then make the the unique um, distinctions that every every neighborhood deserves. Thank. You. Thank you, Council uh, Woman Jackson. Um, Commissioner Jacobs, did you have something else, or your you, maybe yep, you didn't. yes, sir, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Right. Um, I want to thank Council Woman Jackson for. Um, raising this conversation and just mentioning, I worked very hard with staff on this and staff was very dedicated to this initiative about just, just identifying the settlement community. And what happened during that process was just an amazing awareness and amazing, amazing um, involvement with the community just to be recognized and, and just to have their stories heard. Um, and I think this, some of the work we've really noticed is outside of the planning planning department's purview and really outside of what the city should do. But I do think we should work in partnership um, with other organizations to be involved in some of the, the awarenesses and needs of these communities. And I'll just mention that um, we, we already have a model for this, for what Historic Charleston Foundation did with their grant on Mosquito Beach to get the oral histories done, to get the grant to... Um, saved the Pine Tree Motel out there. And I, so there are models and there are organizations in our city that we could work cooperative with to really bounce off this initiative that, that the city proudly put forward on the settlement community. And I was very much honored and proud to be a part of that work. Great, Terrific. that's just what Thank I had you. in mind. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Uh, Commissioner Harrison. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, as a, uh, you know, one of the other kind of questions that I had was about the zoning code rewrite and how, you know, uh, from a planning commission standpoint, whether or not there's going to be, you know, another group of people that could possibly kind of give us this 30,000 feet view about how not only as we rewrite it, but how the process actually works. You know, in our last uh, planning meeting, um, you know, it was brought to our attention that the process makes it to makes it to to makes it too expensive to have uh, workforce housing. So therefore it's easier to pay the fee in lieu, even though we've revised the fee in lieu. Um, and also in that same vein is, you know, kind of this ease of use as, you know, we write the zoning code, the application, how we can um, make it easy for just a single individual. Um, to understand how to walk through the process, you know, be it TRC, storm code, so that it doesn't feel like the zoning code is a deterrent um, to, as uh, has been expressed, this generational wealth, because there has to be a path to get to it. And so what are those shortcuts? Um, I don't know if that's something um, we need to be uh, thinking about um, as we rewrite the code, that there's another piece that says, what's the what's the ease of use, you know, the straightest path is, is you know, how, what's the straight path for being able to apply these, apply these rules and these changes to, you know, to the individual end user, rather than, you know, multifamily uh, complex developer from, you know, off north or something. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Um, I don't know if Robert or Christopher want to reply in any way. So all I would say is, yes, if we if we are able to fund this project and do the rewrite of the code, uh, part of that effort will include an audit of how the code works. So there'll be high level policy conversation that will involve the planning commission, the city council, uh, technical advisory group um, that will help talk about, you know, what are the policy goals building off of the comp plan that we want to achieve with this zoning rewrite. And that goes into that elevation-based zoning concept. Additionally, the it will talk about how can we streamline some of the processes that are outlined under the zoning code. And so part of that will be an audit. Um, part of that audit will include taking an equity lens to the zoning code. Um, and again, not just a, a racial equity, but an equity lens to your point about, you know, great, the people who can afford the land use attorneys and everything else, they can work the code. But what happens when, you know, a, an individual person needs to access uh, the zoning code to be able to accomplish some work? So we will be looking at that is a, all a part of that work plan that would be a part of that project uh, if we are able to get that funded and, and move that forward. Uh, but that 
our code is very complex. It has been amended over and over again over a course of many multiple decades now. Um, and so it will require some work. It, it will not be an easy lift uh, for the, the internal team as well as any consultant we bring on. Uh, it will be a lot of work, but I think it will be good work and it will be something our community can be proud of if we're able to do it. Great, thank you. All right, so um, I don't see any other hands. Uh, um, Chairman Karish, do you wanna close out with any remarks? Well, I just wanted to say thank you uh, for having this meeting today and getting us together with uh, city council and staff. I want to thank staff again for all the work they put into it and city council and the planning commission members. Um, I did want to say it's great that city council could look at some of the ordinances that, we, that come. You know, we have issues that come before us. And I, I think sometimes Mr. Councilmember Waring and uh, Commissioner Lempis can say sometimes we feel like potted plants at the uh, on the planning commission because we have to approve certain things because they meet the guidelines. We don't have the ability to change guidelines That's city council. So we appreciate your looking at the ordinances, changing them as appropriate so that we can better plan with the city. Um, I also want to take a quick opportunity, Mr. Mayor, to thank you, but also, um, you know, we found out last week that our longtime clerk, Marcy Grant, who's been with us uh, 20 years, I think on the planning commission as her clerk, will still work for the city, but not will no longer be our clerk. So we wanted to thank her and, and as city council. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but what a great job she's done as clerk. But as uh, Commission Member Lempsis and Council Member Waring and I have talked about many times, she's just such a wonderful person. So we want to thank her for her work and her service to the city. Oh, well, thank you for that. Appreciate that. Um, well, I give my thanks again to particularly to you commissioners um, for your service to our city, your volunteer service, I would duly note. Thank you. Um, it's, it's amazing dedication that shapes the future of this great city um, by your service. And that's, that's just terrific. So um, Council Member Waring, you wanna help close us out? I do, I wanted to thank everybody for this process. I actually kind of came from the planning commissioners themselves to bring uh, commission and council together. I definitely think it, it builds the strength of the city. But I want to take a personal privilege and thank all my former partners in crime on the planning commission. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Lempesis, Andrew Johnson, Charles Carish. We did a lot of good work over there, man. I, I miss you all. I've told you all that in the past. But um, And obviously uh, having uh, Harry Lassane and Jimmy Bailey and Donna Jacobs and all the new people on that. We've got a great team. It's a great strength of the council. And my goodness, let's keep it together. So uh, thank you for what you all do over there. Yep. And, and Robert and Christopher and everybody else, Chloe, Philip, all the um, uh, our planning uh, department staff, thank you. This, this was a big, uh, huge lift here. Uh, Y'all have uh, gone way beyond, I think, what the city did the last few uh, rounds with this, which was a mere update of an existing plan and uh, really, really rebuilt it from the ground up um, with with uh, a real focus on affordable housing and with um, our management and living with water in the future. It, it, it's a quantum leap change from, from what the city has had before and and I think very progressive and in the right direction uh, with this meeting today. I feel like we're uh, on the same page, our council and our planning commission. And uh, so thank you staff for your efforts and, and helping guide this along and bring it together. It's re really been a remarkable effort. All right, so if there's nothing else good for, uh, um, for the order here, uh, I guess we'll stand adjourned and we'll bring this this here plan to the next city council meeting, uh, or at least in the first October meeting.